This week on Life and Faith. When you knock on the door of the neighbor of a serial killer that you're now taking to jail, that neighbor is likely to say, oh, I'm so glad you're taking that guy to jail. That guy's crazy. I mean, it smells bad over there all the time. There's all kinds of weird noises over there. He's a weirdo to begin with. But then when you take someone to jail for my kinds of cases, and you knock on the neighbor's door and tell them, yeah, I'm taking your neighbor to jail for this case from 30 years ago, they'll typically say, that, oh, there's no way. No, I've known that guy for 30 years. He's a great guy. People that don't forgive themselves tend to harm themselves. So the sun would set at the end of May and not come back to mid-August. Actually, what if it's the most boring thing in the world? No one comes out of history with clean hands. It's a very messy process. Welcome to Life and Faith from the Centre for Public Christianity. I'm Simon Smart. And this week, we're rebroadcasting one of our favourite episodes from a few years back, in which Natasha Moore and I asked the question, why are we all so obsessed with murder? Well, I mean, a lot of us are kind of obsessed with murder. You're actually not that much, right, Simon? No, I have some interest in murder and mayhem, but no, it's not the thing I'm kind of into big time, but lots of people are, right? It's everywhere. It's like... I mean, this is not a scientific, this is not an actual (laughs) statistic, but I feel like about every second show on TV is a crime show. Every second podcast that comes out is a new true crime series. Uh, Crime fiction is always on the bestseller list. Do you know who the best-selling novelist of all time is? I don't, but I'm sure you're going to tell me. me Or given the episode, is it Agatha Christie? It is Agatha Christie. She sold more than 2 billion copies of her more than 70 novels. And all of this does sort of beg the question, what's so addictive about this stuff? Why are we so interested in it? What is wrong with us that we're so obsessed with murder and mayhem and all these awful things that are really terrible in real life? Yeah, I do wonder this as well, what it says about us if we're Mm. kind of terrible people. Yeah, George Orwell, the writer, wrote this essay in the 1940s called Decline of the English Murder, where he was talking about how, you know, people complain that you never get a good murder nowadays. (laughs) Like in the papers, people sit down and it's a pastime. But I think there are kind of more benign theories about why this stuff is so interesting to us. So one of them is about, you know, exposure therapy. We have these fears and this is a safe way of dealing with them. Um, Bringing order and certainty to a world that's kind of chaotic and frightening. You know, they're puzzles. You fix them. It's solved done and that's kind of satisfying so I think there are psychological needs that these stories can meet yes and Natasha you've spoken to some experts on this topic I was wondering who do you go to to get experts on murder yeah I mean I'm not sure that's exactly what they put (laughs) on their business cards but I had two very different conversations about this topic I had a bit of a chat with Alison Milbank who is a literary scholar at the University of Nottingham and an Anglican priest as well. So she comes at this from kind of the perspective of story and culture, but also theology. And then I also got to talk to an actual cold case detective, a guy called Jim Warner Wallace, which is just the greatest detective name ever. He sounds very film noir. Yeah, I believe it's his real name even. So it's clearly suited to his profession. And he could give me a bit of a reality check on these kinds of stories. So first, here's Alison on why she thinks we're so addicted to this stuff. It just seems like a real invitation for a theologian, really, because when I was a child, not everything was a detective story. Now it is on television. And it's almost as if we all want to know, we want to know the big question, who did it? (laughs) And also there's a big interest in pathologists. I did this too in Australia as well, but in America and Britain, a lot of these programs are about pathologists as well, as if they can tell us about ourselves, as if looking at the body is somehow going to give you some kind of knowledge. And these seem to me really big existential questions are behind this. And also, I think, a sense of seeking a kind of meaning and order in existence as well as justice you know because that's partly what they're about they're about people seeking justice as well as who did it so it's because we are dealing with what we think is more uncertainty that this like the certainty of this genre maybe appeals to us i think that's very much 
obviously people tend to, they call them cosy, Agatha Christie's, they call cosy detectives <laughs> on the bookshelves in Britain. You can actually, there's a whole genre called cosy detectives. But I don't think Agatha Christie is particularly cosy. Um, W.H. Auden wrote uh, an essay called The Guilty Vicarage, where he says that what happens in that kind of 1930s type story is that a murder happens and everybody is potentially guilty. That's the thing. It uncovers this cosy world and shows that everybody is fallible in some ways and everybody might have done it. And then the detective comes along like a kind of priest, finds the guilty person, sort of forgives, as it were, all the others and restores order. That's so interesting. I mean, of course, with Father Brown um, and in Grantchester as well, the detective is the priest. Yes, Father Brown, I think, is a lot deeper than Grantchester. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> I'm afraid. The wonderful thing about Father Brown is he's these dumpy little Catholic priest whom nobody notices. And he solves mysteries in which people often think there is some supernatural thing going on. They can't explain it. And he always kind of demythologizes this and actually shows what really happened. And he does so by imagining himself into the mind of the murderer, because he always says in other circumstances, this could have been I, this could have been me. So it's a much deeper understanding of the human. One of the key features of this genre is how many rules there are. It's highly conventional in the sense that it needs to make sure to do this and not do that or else it won't be satisfying as a story. Things like it's pretty much always the most unlikely person who committed the murder. It can't be the obvious suspect. This is a classic Agatha Christie trope. And there should be proper clues so that if you're switched on enough, you can figure it out at home. It shouldn't be, you know, some complete stranger that you couldn't have guessed. But these rules don't necessarily have much in common with what homicide is like in real life. Yeah, presumably they have almost nothing in common <laughs> with <laughs> real murder. So I figured this would be a good thing to get some input from someone who is familiar with the real thing. Jim Warner Wallace was a detective for more than 25 years. He's been on Dateline and NBC to talk about murders that he's solved. He's been called the evidence whisperer. He has a very cool job. Jim confessed to me that he's not really interested in murder mysteries. He doesn't watch the crime shows. He doesn't read the detective novels. He said not many people in his line of work do. But he definitely has thoughts on why so many of us are drawn to these stories. For a couple of reasons. Number one, I think that they're action-filled. Uh, there's always some uh, potential in any kind of law enforcement work that you're going to do something that's going to be dangerous or you're going to encounter somebody who is dangerous. I think that is appealing to people. Also, I think it taps into our um, kind of an understanding of human nature, it, and it can be disturbing. You know, anything that rattles your worldview, the way you you see yourself the way you see humans in general, kind of a, whatever your view of anthropology is. Why are humans the way we are? How can somebody who does this also do that? You know, if you look at some beautiful thing they are involved in, and then that's the same guy who killed his wife last night. I mean, these are the kinds of things that I think are intriguing because they challenge or affirm our worldview going in. Both Alison and Jim raised this question of human nature. Does looking at crime at some of the worst things that humans do to each other, tell us something about ourselves. I asked Jim to unpack this worldview element a bit more for me. Well, okay, so you know, worldviews basically answer three important questions. How do we get here? Why is it so messed up? And how do we fix it? And your worldview is going to have some description of human nature. And sometimes we just develop a worldview by study, and sometimes we develop a worldview by just observation over time. We live in a certain world, and it confirms for us what we think of human nature. Or we've had experiences with humans that either shape or rattle what we think of human nature. I work cold cases. These are the cases that went unsolved for 30 years. I don't work serial killers. Those are different kinds of cases put it this way, when you knock on the door of the neighbor of a serial killer that you're now taking to jail, 
that neighbor is likely to say, oh, I'm so glad you're taking that guy to jail. That guy's crazy. I mean, it mm-hmm. smells bad over there all the time. There's all kinds of weird noises over there. He's a weirdo to begin with, and he's always digging holes in his backyard. I'm not quite <laughs> sure what to make of all that, right? Uh-huh. But then when you take someone to jail for my kinds of cases, where a guy did a murder 30 years ago and got away with it, and you knock on the neighbor's door and then tell him, yeah, I'm taking your neighbor to jail for this case from 30 years ago, they'll typically say, that, oh, there's no way. There's no way that guy could – no, I've known that guy for 30 years. He's a great guy, and, and that's because this guy's a killer, but he only did one murder. He did one murder 30 years ago, and he's basically lived like everybody else ever since, and that's how he got away with it. Now, granted, one's enough to make you a killer, Yeah. but in, in essence, he's displayed the character that all the rest of us have displayed over the last 30 years. He's your banker. He's your neighbor. He's your teacher. He's your professor. He's your deacon in your church. I mean, these are guys and gals that, for the most part, look just like everybody else. And so your your whatever your worldview is that describes humans, you've got to make room in it for this description of humans. What you discover is that your view of human nature at some point has to accommodate this reality. And once it does, and not every worldview does a good job of that. Uh, but once it does, then you'll see yourself differently, too, because the truth of it is, is that, you know, but for the grace of God, every single one of us is that same killer. It just hasn't been provoked to the point of actually committing the crime. Thinking about cold cases, maybe this is one of the differences between the real thing and what we see on TV. I'm wondering how often they get solved. I mean, in the shows, it's always 100 percent, right? The success rate for unsolved yeah. cases is 100 percent. I imagine sure. it's quite low in real life. Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's very low because you might, you know, I think I might open 30 cases and solve eight. Sadly, when you're working for an agency that's doing cold cases, you really have to think about the practical nature of it, right? So, for example, I don't typically jump into a bunch of whodunits. So uh, I'm not interested in whodunits. I'm really interested in a case where maybe they had three or four good suspects, but they could never develop enough information or enough evidence to make a case against one of those five or one of those four or one of those three. But at least my field is not every citizen of Los Angeles County in 1979. (laughs) It is these three or four candidates so I've already, that's helpful, right? Now, the reason why we do that is because it's not cheap to do cold case investigations. It costs your agency a ton of money, and these are not quick. So I run a bunch of cases simultaneously, and I've had cases. I had one case that was committed in 1979. I reopened the case in 2003. The first search warrant was written in 2006 or seven. We made the arrest in 2009. We adjudicated it and convicted him in 2014. So that's a case that took 11 years. And that's going to cost your agency something. (laughs) So, (laughs) so, and I've also done cases where I were true whodunits. I had no idea. And I spent a year and a half. I was no closer at the end than I was at the beginning. And I just realized that at some point, my agency, I owe it to my agency to try to focus on the cases that I have the best chance of of doing something, even though they seem like they're lost as well. Some are better than others, and I owe it to the agency for financial reasons to focus on the cases that have the best chance to solve. I'm wondering, what do you think it says about us as a society that we actually dedicate resources to cold cases? Well, it probably says something good, um, I think, about who we are as a people that we would even care. Um, And I'll tell you why. In our agency, we have as many, you know, we have a lot more new murders than we have old unsolved murders. And the new murders are in the press when they happen. They demand attention from the culture we're living in, right? It happened yesterday. It was horrific. It's going to be the paper today, tomorrow. Any little change in the case over the next month or two months is going to be released. It's going to be part of the public psyche. That case that happened in 1979 has been long forgotten. There's nothing. No one's bringing it up. There's really no reason to work it if what we're concerned about is just allaying the attention of the press. We'd have to have a deeper reason, a deeper view of the sanctity of life that would cause us to pull up something that's unsolved, that all we can do is fail. And this is why it's so hard to get DAs to file cold cases. They're like, look, we got to win this. We're not going to take a, a risk because everyone's forgotten about this case. If the thing that reminds them is our failure in a jury trial, that's not good for us. So what would cause us then to want to go back on a case that, well, I think a lot of it is 
that we have a high regard for human life. Is that just because we, we treat our species with, with favoritism? If we were if we were dogs, we would only investigate dog murders. I mean, is that what we're doing, or or is it that we think that there's something different about humans that we've kind of earned the right just by our very existence to have our murders taken seriously? And if that's the case, again, that's a worldview issue, right? Is there something that you think is special about humans, or is this idea in culture becoming offensive? From our worldview as Christians, we actually think that there's something unique about humans, designed and created in the image of God. That means that even if that case goes cold for 35 years, I should go back and open it again, because that's that's not a, a small thing. That's an important thing. Wonderful. And I, I, I grant you, you can get to that point through a number of other worldviews, but it seems to me that the Christian worldview survives as well as it has for 2,000 years because it makes the best sense of the world the way it really is. Even our desire to go back and open an unsolved case. In this episode of Life and Faith, we're thinking about our culture's preoccupation with murder. Now, Natasha, you've been speaking with Detective Jim Warner-Wallace, who's worked on cold cases for decades. But a big part of his story is really interesting. He goes from being a kind of hard-boiled atheist to a Christian believer. Yeah, he even then goes on to get a theology degree. And Mm. these days he does a lot of teaching and speaking on worldview and on the evidence for Christianity, while still, of course, consulting on cold (laughs) cases. So here's Jim on how he ended up doing both of those things. Well, my dad uh, was in this profession uh, for 30 years before I did it. And so uh, growing up, I saw him involved in it. Not that I wanted to do it. I actually have a bachelor's degree in design and a master's degree in architecture. And then I became a police officer. So I've got a weird uh, Yeah, that's not a usual path. (laughs) Yeah, not the usual path. But uh, in the end, I I felt like this was a calling in a sense, uh, that it was very noble. Um, that it was, you know, I think you always think your dad's work's noble, even if it's not probably, but, but I thought it was noble. I didn't think I was particularly gifted for it, but, you know, I think actually in some, in some ways I can see now looking back at it, that, that I had a skill set that was, was helpful just being able to visualize things and to be able to make those visual connections for people and for juries that has been, I think, really helpful. Are there other characteristics that are especially important in your line of work in terms of are you an especially observant person? Can you easily tell when people are lying, that kind of thing? Well, I don't think that we necessarily, all of us have some intuitive sense, right? If you're you're married to your spouse, if they lied to you, you probably have some intuitive sense that something's not quite right. But but that's a skill that you develop over time. And you can actually exercise uh, to to become good at, at things like that. And so... You know, when I first started, I um, I loved doing interviews, but I wasn't always good, at least in the beginning, of spotting the deception indicators or spotting those things that would help me know if somebody's lying. But as, um, you know, you study it, it becomes a point of study, and then you practice it. I mean, I interviewed thousands of people uh, in an effort to get, and I didn't always catch the things, but I, I usually, especially if I had a way of recording it, you know, if I could record it, even if I don't even need the uh, video, just if I had audio, uh, I was enough for me to go back over and catch the things because what the hardest thing about catching deception indicators is catching them all in real time. Now, once you record it and you look back at it a couple of times, you can say, "Oh, right there, there it is, right there." That's the, the tell. Can you give us some tips? Um, there's lots of things we look at, like in forensic statement analysis, and that basically is just a process where we take a written and a verbal statement from suspects and witnesses and um, potential suspects. And what you're looking for are the little things that give you insight, uh, you know, the stuff that's between the lines that gives you insight about how people – because, you, you, look, in the end, when we say something or write something, we, we select the words that we're going to use to express this. I can tell a lot about the person I'm talking to just from the kinds of optional words they use or if I've got choices where I could describe my wife as my wife, my lovely wife, the wife. I mean, there's lots of ways of describing my wife mm-hmm. and each one, depending on the context and depending on what your patterns are, that takes a little while to figure out. Maybe this is the way he always says it and I've got to figure that out. But if you've got enough time with people, you can see how their optional use of pronouns, adjectives, adverbs, what kinds of things they compress So if they've got an hour of time and they just skip right over it, or if they're taking an hour to describe what only took 10 minutes to happen, 
So we're looking for expansion and contraction of time. There's lots of things we're looking at that will help us to determine, you know, if nothing else, this is the area we need to re-interview about because this is where I see a problem. Yeah, my background's actually literary criticism, so I'm loving the kind of language stuff, how important that is. Yeah, well, and to be honest, it's very similar to literary yeah. criticism, but, but here's where I think we have an advantage. So you're somebody who's involved in, in literary criticism, and I have lots of friends who are involved in this form of criticism, and they, they'll apply it to the biblical text or to other ancient texts, and they will um, draw inferences from what some of the same stuff that I'm seeing. Right, Some of the same stuff that I see in suspect statements – by the way, I did this with the Gospels and the New Testament right away because I wasn't a believer. I was 35 before I became a believer, and at 35, the first thing I did was a forensic statement analysis of the Gospels. Now, I can tell you one thing that's helpful, though, is that detectives, if they take this approach and they really are serious about their craft, they have an advantage over academics who do literary criticism because we – do a lot more, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> every single case. And we sometimes get to re-interview to see if our inference that we assume from the first time around by basically doing literary criticism. But now we get to re-interview to see if we were right. This is the real twist in Jim's story, how he came to apply his skills as a detective to assessing the truth claims of the Christian faith. But I was working on a cover in a surveillance team, and I was kind of the team interviewer. You know, I was the guy that if we got somebody in custody in this next 30 minutes is going to be critical, they would put me in the room with them and see uh, how far we could get. So that was always my, I was always interested in words, uh, the kinds of words that people use when they have choices. So uh, my wife was interested in going to church. I was not, but I was happy to go with her as a non-believer. There's no Christians in my family, but my dad's the same way as a cop. He would be happy to go with his spouse, um, you know, my stepmother, you'd be happy to go with her as a non-believer. And actually, it's happy for anyone who has faith. He feels like, hey, this is a very useful delusion. If it's working for you, <laughs> and it's helping you raise your kids, giving you some peace, and it's useful, great. I don't think it's true. I was the same way. I didn't think it was true. But if she wants to go, I'll go. So I, I went. And um, the pastor that first day that we were in church just made the statement that, he, he said that Jesus was super smart, was the smartest man who ever lived, in fact. And um, I, of course, didn't believe that to be the case, but I was interested to see what it was that Jesus had to say. Like, why would this guy think this is true? So I went out and invested all of $6 in a uh, pew Bible at a local bookshop, and I started just—I assumed it would be like fortune cookie, uh, proverbial statements of Jesus. I didn't expect to, to open it up and see that it's actually an account that seems to be written as a historical narrative by people who want us to believe this stuff actually happened. That was uh, surprising to me. Um, so in other words, you have accounts here that allegedly contain events that are not just allegorical, proverbial statements of Jesus. They are actually things they want us to believe happened. Well, there's a skill set you could use to determine if eyewitness accounts are reliable. And you just happen to have that skill set. Well, I mean, I don't know that it's a perfect system, but nothing is perfect. Mm -hmm. um, what we do is we make the most reasonable inference from evidence in these cases, even though we have large, glaring, unanswered questions. You know, as an atheist, I couldn't tell you how the universe began, how life begins in the universe, why the universe appears to be fine-tuned, why biology appears to be designed, how we possess these immaterial things called minds and have free agency in an entirely deterministic physical universe, and how we can even embrace certain moral truths as though they are objectively true for all of us. Look, I had unanswered questions as an atheist, but I held on to that position for 35 years in spite of unanswered questions. So I knew that I didn't have to answer every question to draw a reasonable inference. And when I finally drew the reasonable inference, I also knew I wouldn't, I still have unanswered questions. I mean, I'm stuck there. So I knew that this system that I could use to evaluate the Gospels is like every other system. It's imperfect, mm. but it's sufficient to determine if the claims are reliable. What was decisive for you in making that decision to become a Christian? Well, I mean, there's not one thing. So all my cases, I call these, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts. Hmm. These are cases where you've got you know, 80 pieces of evidence that point to this suspect. 
any one of those pieces of evidence, I'm not sure I would want to go to trial with just that one piece. I think the jurors could easily say that's not sufficient. But when you have all 80 and they point to the same reasonable inference, ah, this is now heavy and weighty. And that's where I, I was with the Gospels. I mean, I knew that I had to evaluate them to determine, number one, were they early enough to have been written by eyewitnesses? Number two, could I corroborate or verify them in any way through history, the statements of non-believers at the time, internal evidence, external evidence? Three, could I demonstrate they hadn't been changed or altered over time? And finally, four, that the writers possess a bias that would cause me to recognize that they might incline something in a certain direction because of that bias or that motive. Those are the four ways we evaluate eyewitnesses in jury trials. So that's a lot of stuff. In each one of those four categories, there might be a hundred pieces of evidence that will either assist you or you know eliminate an account. So that's why you know is there any one thing? Not really. Uh, six months into this, I was like, wow, this is. A, I mean, I don't know what's keeping me out except that I rejected anything supernatural. So I got to a point where I really felt comfortable with the reliable nature of the eyewitness accounts. But how do you reconcile supernatural events? You could test them all you want. Now, if out of hand before you start, you're like, hey, I don't care. If it's got a supernatural event, it can't be true. Well, okay, then then you're not going to ever get to a place where you're going to be comfortable with the gospel accounts because they mm -hmm. include supernatural acts. But, of course, you know, I had to ask myself, you know, as an atheist, I believe there was something incredibly supernatural about the beginning of the universe. In other words, if all space, time, and matter leapt into existence as, you know, Big Bang cosmology, the standard cosmological model, that's what it tells us. That means that the first cause has to be something non-spatial, non-temporal, non-material. So whatever it is that causes the universe has to be outside of nature. So I was already in the bandwagon. I was already in the group that says, I believe there's something extra natural that's at work in the universe. Now, so the question becomes, why would we think that that supernatural force couldn't also be responsible for other things we see, and maybe even in the Gospels? So I was able, I think, at some point to at least be honest about it. Okay, I've got to suspend my hesitation, suspend my disbelief long enough to evaluate the claims and not just start off by saying, hey, out of hand, I could never even begin this investigation because before I start, I think I know the answer. I don't believe in anything supernatural. That's never a good way to start an investigation. Jim has written a series of books about all this. The first one is called Cold Case Christianity, and it really takes you through all the things that investigating Christian faith has in common with investigating a cold case. Stuff like evaluating eyewitness accounts, chain of custody, circumstantial evidence, and it's also peppered with examples from cases that Jim's worked on. There's even a version for kids that he wrote with his wife, Susie. I had one last question for Jim. For people who are as skeptical about the Christian faith as you were, what would you like them to know? I think that skepticism is always healthy. I don't have a problem with people who are skeptical, and I think I know I've been there. I was there for so long at 35. I'm still I'm not 70, so more than half my life was spent as an unbeliever who was skeptical. Actually, if you knew me before, I was not. I was more than skeptical. I was actually pretty aggressive. Uh, because a lot of the people I knew who were Christians, I did not find to be incredibly thoughtful. And if I asked them a simple question, they were not good at answering those simple questions. And I just thought, this is not true based on the kinds of Christians I was meeting who didn't seem to be able to defend it as though it was true. So the first thing I'd say is, you know, I, I'm not interested in Christians. I'm interested in Christianity. So the first thing I would say to skeptical people is take people out of it. Mm -hmm. The claim is either true. Now, you might say, well, if the claim is true, shouldn't everyone be transformed by the claim? Well, that's, that's, there's a range of the way people react to anything. The fact that something is true about the nature of God and the offer of salvation that Christianity describes doesn't necessarily mean you're not going to still meet people who are jerks. <laughs> and that, you know, that's the one common thing we have is that fallen nature. And it's in our rebellion to that God. That doesn't go away once you become a Christian. You still... You have that busted wheel, you know, it's not like you, that gets fixed. It might get better. I hope it does. I hope we're all a work in progress. But I still know that most of what I was doing was judging a worldview on the basis of its um, adherence, you know. So you could probably do the same thing with every group, right? As, as an atheist, there's a whole range of people who behave in a whole range of different ways. I don't hold that against atheism. So the first thing I think I would say is be focused more on the claims 
than on the people who make them. You've been listening to the murder episode of Life and Faith with me, Simon Smart, and Natasha Moore. And this was a good week to rebroadcast this conversation because a 10th anniversary edition of J. Warner Wallace's book, Cold Case Christianity, has just been released with a bunch of new material in it. So it's a good moment to get yourself a copy of that. And if you want to hear more from Alison Milbank, Natasha also interviewed her about fantasy literature and why we love that especially the popularity of Tolkien. That episode is called The Desire for Dragons, and you can find it in our back catalogue. It's a perennial topic as well. And our thanks to both our guests today, and also, of course, to our producer, the masterful Alan Douthwaite. Now, before we go, there's something I really want to mention. CPX has been hosting the annual Richard Johnson Lecture here in Australia for almost 10 years. And this year, clinical psychologist Lisa Aitken will be speaking on the topic, Rediscovering Hope, How We Lost It, How We Get It Back. This public event will be in Perth on October 26th and in Sydney on November the 1st. For more information and to get your tickets, go to publicchristianity.org. I highly recommend that. Next week. I think um, valuing one another, that communal thinking, that we are all in this together rather than on our own. And what's mine is mine, what's yours is yours. But to learn that, no, we share this life. And that's the thinking and the worldview of our culture. It's a village concept.